Welcome to Teaching Through the Bible with Dr. Ken Sullivan. As a veteran senior pastor, Dr. Sullivan understands the importance of Bible teaching in the spiritual growth and development of God's people. Dr. Sullivan's method of teaching the Bible is to read and carefully explain each chapter and verse in clear and understandable terms so the student of the Bible gains the full understanding of God's Word. Now prepare yourself to learn and grow as Dr. Sullivan teaches through the Bible. Well, hello and welcome to another session of Teaching Through the Bible. I'm Dr. Kenneth Sullivan. Well, today we're studying 1 Corinthians chapter 16, the final chapter of this great book. And I'm reading as usual in the New Living Translation. So let's get started with our study. I'm reading verses 1 through 4 of 1 Corinthians chapter 16. Now about the money being collected for the Christians in Jerusalem, you should follow the same procedures I gave to the churches in Galatia. On every Lord's Day, each of you should put aside some amount of money in relation to what you've earned and save it for this offering. Don't wait until I get there and then try to collect it all at once. When I come, I will write letters of recommendation for the messengers you choose to deliver your gift to Jerusalem. And if it seems appropriate for me also to go along, then we can travel together. Now, here Paul shifts his focus, uh, the focus of this letter, from the subject of, of the resurrection of the dead and the rapture of the church, and certainly the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, uh, and the rapture of the church to the practical matter of collecting funds. Uh, the saints at Jerusalem were suffering financial hardship, possibly due to a famine that had been predicted by uh, a prophet named Agabus. And you can find that information in the book of Acts chapter 11, verses 28 through 30. Paul had the responsibility of, of seeking aid for these saints, those the Jerusalem saints. So he was appealing to the saints in Corinth to give some money to, to uh, aid those who were in Jerusalem who were suffering from this, uh, uh, this terrible hardship. He probably uh, made the saints at Corinth aware of this need earlier in one of his letters or by word of mouth because he told them to follow the same procedure he had given to them uh, to the saints in uh, the church of Galatia, who were also giving to this cause. Now, this method of collecting funds was done in a way that avoided um, uh, haphazard and disorganized collections. It gave the saints time to decide how much they would give, and uh, by uh, recommending someone other than himself uh, to handle the funds, the issue of accountability was also addressed here. Now, the willingness on the part of the churches to rally together and come to the aid of their fellow saints across cultural and racial lines is a demonstration of Christian love and unity. This act of kindness and sacrifice is a, uh, is a statement to the world of unbelievers that these diverse members of the body of Christ perceive themselves as one unified body of believers universally. Now I'm reading verses five through seven. I'm coming to visit you after I have been to Macedonia, if I'm planning to travel through Macedonia. It could be that I will stay, uh, stay a while with you, perhaps all winter, and then you can send me on my way to the next destination. This time, I don't want to make just a short visit, then go right on. I want to come and stay a while, if the Lord will let me. So uh, Paul's method was to establish a church. He'd go into a territory and, and preach out a church in a particular area. He would cultivate an apostolic relationship with the people and maintain that relationship by, by letters and by sending other ministers to them. Then, as often as he could, he would pay those uh, uh, those uh, saints a, a personal visit. Now, in this particular case, he wanted to visit the, the church at uh, Corinth for an extended stay. He wanted to stay with them for a while. He didn't want to just pass through. He wanted to spend some real time with them. And uh, he wanted to um, perhaps even spend the entire winter with them and uh, spend some time teaching them and, and uh, building up their faith. 
Now, it was customary for the church to to uh, help finance his trip to, uh, uh, to the next destination. He would go there, do his work, minister to the saints, uh, meet their needs, their spiritual needs, and then they would in turn uh, pay his transportation costs to the next destination. Paul depended on support from the churches he established and, and ministered to. Now, this support made it possible for him to continue ministering to others. Uh, while he was not timid about accepting such financial support, he was careful to maintain a level of accountability, which eliminated any question um, uh, about his absolute honesty and integrity. Now, Paul was a little bit re- reluctant, well, quite a bit reluctant to ex- even accept money from the uh, from the uh, Corinthian saints for his own support, because there had been uh, uh, a little hesitance on their part uh, toward him because of false teachers who had come in and, and turned their minds and their hearts against Paul. So uh, he de- he determined that he was not going to accept any uh, personal financial report, uh, support from them, uh, this particular church, but he was willing to accept uh, support and aid from them to give to the other churches in need, particularly this church um, in, in Jerusalem. They were suffering. If a church was unable or unwilling to support Paul, he would find a job, usually as a tent maker, and work um, or, or rely on other churches to, to support him. Now I'm reading verses 8 and 9. In the meantime, I'll be staying here at Ephesus until the festival of Pentecost. For there is a wide open door for great work here, and many people are responding but there are many who oppose me. Now, the words of verse nine reveal to us that great opportunities are often guarded by opposition from spiritual forces, demonic forces. Um, When there is a great opportunity uh, for ministry and for blessing the lives of people, leading many to Christ, uh, it's all it's all uh, often guarded by demonic forces who who uh, oppose the work of God. Paul had a wide open door to do a great deal of work at Ephesus, and many people were responding to the gospel message. But at the same time, there were many who were opposing him, and certainly Satan stirs up trouble in various ways. Um, it's not a coincidence that along with the great opportunity and the great response, uh, there is this great opposition. Satanic opposition can be expected to swirl around any such great opportunity. Satan and his demonic forces are as much aware of the great opportunities uh, to bring many people into fellowship with Christ as we may be. Uh, In fact, there are times when he may be even more aware of the opportunities than we are. Understanding the potential for people to come to Christ, Satan works behind the scene, stirring up negative thoughts, emotions, opinions, uh, and people, and orchestrating negative circumstances in an effort to move people in the wrong direction. He wants to discourage those who are sent to do the great work and take advantage of that opportunity, and he wants to turn the hearts of the people away. And, and certainly Paul met with such great uh, opposition. He'll put thoughts in the minds of people. He'll put, he put jealousy in the hearts uh, of the Jews when uh, Paul went into a synagogue to preach and the people responded well. Uh, then the Jewish leaders would get jealous and they would begin to oppose Paul. And, and all kinds of things stirred up. In one city he was, he was in, um, I believe it was in, it was in Ephesus where there was uh, uh, opposition by a, a, a silversmith who made silver shrines for the for the idol goddesses there, and um, and and they opposed. There was a riot there, and and so when we go to seize these great opportunities, we need to be aware, not afraid, but aware of the fact that uh, we might meet with opposition, and and when we meet with opposition, we need to be aware that behind that, behind these people. Uh, these attitudes and the trouble that is being stirred up. There are satanic forces that are trying to stop the work by any means necessary to discourage us, to uh, turn the people into turmoil, 
to just mess up the whole situation uh, and uh, curtail the opportunity. Now, if Satan cannot stop the work, he'll try to hinder or create trouble for those involved in leading the work. He'll try to create havoc and confusion and hostility to discourage people enough to cause them to quit or, or somehow to remove them from the work. Now, again, Paul had many of these kinds of situations where there was great opportunity and, and there was a great response to his message, but there was almost always many ad, ad, ad adversaries or there was much uh, adversity standing in his way and he had to work through those. As a result, he suffered beatings, imprisonment, shipwrecked. He was stoned on one occasion uh, and he, he suffered a great deal uh, because he was adamant and determined that he was not going to turn around. And, and he continued on and despite all that. Now you can uh, read about the sufferings of Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 24 through 27, and we'll get there eventually. Now, despite all these things, Paul declared that we are more than conquerors through Christ who loves us. And that's in Romans 8 and 37. Now I'm reading verses 10 through 11. When Timothy comes, treat him with respect. He is doing the Lord's work, just as I am. Don't let anyone despise him. Send him on his way with your blessings when he returns to me. I'm looking forward to seeing him soon, along with the other brothers. So Timothy was a young disciple. Paul had taken under his wing and was, was uh, teaching and mentoring and training. He helped uh, to personally train and, and uh, mentor him for ministry. And apparently because of his youth, because he was a young man, there was the potential for some of the saints to disrespect and look down on him. In one of his letters, Paul urged Timothy not to allow anyone to despise or look down on him because he was young, but Paul urged him to be an example to the saints uh, on how he conducted himself, how he lived in his faith and just generally how he conducted himself. And that's in 1 Timothy uh, chapter 4, verse 12. Now, Paul affirmed Timothy as a leader in the church who was worthy of full honor uh, and, and worthy of their utmost respect. He urged the church to give him the respect that he was due and, and to treat him as they would treat any other church leader that he might send. Now, I'm reading verse 12. Now about our brother Apollos, I urged him to join the other brothers when they visit you, but he was not willing to come right now. He will be seeing you later when the time is right. So there was an evangelistic group who, uh, who traveled to different churches, or actually there were evangelistic groups. There were several groups who traveled to different churches, carrying letters and keeping the churches informed on what was happening in the other churches and in the world at large. Apollos was one of these traveling evangelists. Apollos was a well-respected leader in the church. He was said to be an eloquent speaker uh, who knew the scriptures well. And you can read that in Acts chapter 18, verse 24. Apollos is first introduced to us in the book of Acts. He uh, zealously preached about Christ but he was somewhat uninformed. He didn't uh, have all the information. He was still preaching John's baptism uh, of repentance until Priscilla and Aquila came along, a husband and wife evangelist team. Um, uh, they came along and took him aside and fully explained the uh, baptism of Christ, about Christ and the gospel, full gospel message. You can find that in Acts chapter 18, verses 24 through 26. <clears throat> now, Paul and Apollos, had established a bond and a friendship. Paul had urged them to join a certain group who were scheduled to visit the Corinthian church, uh, but Apollos was uh, either unwilling or unprepared to join them at that particular time. But Paul assured them that he would pay them a visit at a later date. Now I'm reading verses 13 through 16. Be on guard. Stand true to what you believe. Be courageous. Be strong. And everything you do must be done with love. You know that Stephanus and his household were the first to become Christians in Greece 
and they are spending their lives in service to other Christians. I urge you, dear brothers and sisters, to respect them fully and others like them who serve with such devotion. So Paul reminds the saints at Corinth that they must stay focused on love as the motivation for everything that they do. They must be careful not to lose focus. If we're not careful, we can drift over into a tendency of just doing our work out of a, out of a sense of duty. It's possible to do good without love as, as the basis or the motivation. And now it's good to remind ourselves um, that what we do, we do for the love of God and the love of people. So Paul is reminding them of that. Uh, he uses uh, Stephanus as his, uh, uh, and his family as examples. Paul urged the saints at Corinth to be watchful and to stand up for what they believe. Uh, he urged them to have deep respect for this man, Stephanus, uh, and his family, they had uh, devoted themselves to the work of God. And King James says, addicted, they had addicted themselves to the work. Uh, and so Paul urged them to, to follow his example and to honor these people, this man, uh, Stephanus. Uh, but he also urged them to be courageous and to be strong. Now, this is Paul's second mention of Stephanus. Early, he mentioned him uh, having baptized him in uh, chapter 1, verse 16. Paul applied, uh, uh, actually applauded Stephanus and the members of his family for their attitude of concern and, and service for other people. Now, they were not mere talkers, but they were doers of the word and of the work of the Lord. They expressed their love for others through the service that they rendered. Now, in his letter to the church at Ephesus, Paul informed them that we Christians were created for the purpose of of doing good works. That's our, our purpose, Ephesians 2 and 10. Uh, he was pleased with Stephanus for fulfilling that part of his purpose. Now, this is the whole goal of Christian training and teaching, to bring us to the place where we love God with everything that is within us. Uh, we love our neighbors as ourselves, and we express that love through good works. Find that in Matthew 22 and 37 through 40. Now I'm reading verses 17 through 18. I'm so glad that Stephanus, Fortunatus, and Achaicus have come here. They have been making up for the help you weren't here to give me. They have been a wonderful encouragement to me, as they have been to you, too. You must give proper honor to all who serve so well. Uh, this is an important point, which is often overlooked by pastors and church leaders. Sometimes those who work hardest and the most and are the most faithful and dependable are overlooked. Now, this is not intentional, but because they are self-motivated and because they work in silence and don't call attention to themselves, <clears throat> these people are often taken for granted. On the other hand, those who have to be cajoled and prodded to work often receive the most honor and the most attention and the most praise for their meager efforts as incentive to get them to continue. Our physical bodies are a good example of that. We give no attention to certain parts of our bodies as long as they're functioning well. However, when something goes wrong and begins to hit and miss, then it gets a lot of attention. We give that particular part of the body uh, more attention than all the other parts of the body, trying to get it to function a as it should. And that's what often happens in the church. Uh, we have to cajole people. We have to praise and encourage people uh, to do the work because uh, church work is voluntary. And so, uh, the squeaky wheel actually gets the grease. That's what the old the old saying says. The squeaky wheel gets the grease. So uh, sometimes we unfairly heap attention upon those who are who are least deserving of it, and uh, we may not give the the proper attention to those who are working faithfully behind the scenes, not demanding attention, not de demanding praise, but just 
doing what they're supposed to do. And so as pastors, we have to be careful about that. We have to make sure that uh, we give honor to those who are most worthy of honor. Now I'm reading verses 19 through 24. The churches here in the province of Asia greet you heartily in the Lord. Along with Aquila and Priscilla and all the others who gather in their home for church meetings. All the brothers and sisters here have asked me to greet you for them. Greet each other in Christian love. Here is my greeting, which I write with my own hand, Paul. If anyone does not love the Lord, that person is cursed. Our Lord come. May the grace of the Lord Jesus be with you. May love, uh, my love to all of you in Christ Jesus. So Paul Close this letter with greetings from his uh, companions and fellow laborers. The, the greeting from all the churches in Asia includes, uh, indicate, and it indicates that there was regular contact between these churches. Paul wanted to maintain contact between these churches. He wanted them to know each other, even though they may not ever see each other. He wanted to know that they existed, that they, that, that they loved the people of the other churches, and he was trying to create uh, unity and cohesiveness between the churches. They were aware that Paul was, com uh, was uh, uh, of his communication from one church to the other. So he tried to keep them in the loop. These churches had a sense of unity and connectedness that is to be admired and emulated. Paul, uh, regardless of our denominational, of, of our denominational affiliation, um, uh, we are all one universal church. It doesn't matter whether we are non-denomination, whether we are, are um, a part of a major denomination. Uh, as long as we are believers in Christ and we are uh, uh, embracing uh, Christ and his teaching, we are one with the universal church of God, people that we will never see on this side of heaven. We will see there. So Paul fostered this connection between these churches by involving them in the work that required the participation of each church. He maintained contact between the churches, mentioning the different churches in his, in his different letters and offering warm greetings from one church to another uh, as he did in this closing letter. Now, Paul also occasionally had members or leaders from some of the churches to travel with him so they could meet and bond with the members of the other churches. Paul understood the importance uh, of having these churches bond and unite across geographical, social, and cultural boundaries. He was creative in facilitating a sense of kinship between the churches. Now, in these closing words, we learn that Aquila and Priscilla, the evangelistic couple, um, either led or hosted church meetings in their home. It's important to understand that the early church had no grand church facilities uh, in which they worshiped. They met in people's homes and in public meeting places. During times of heavy, heavy persecution, they met in secret places like the upper rooms. And then and later on, they met, uh, uh, churches met in the catacombs of places of uh, burial places and among tombs, wherever they could meet in secret. And uh, uh, so uh, there was not these grand churches, and, uh, uh, but, but they met in, in, they were smaller churches and some were, some were of size, but various different kinds of churches, but they met wherever they could, could meet. Uh, as in the, on the day of Pentecost, the saints met in the upper room when the Holy Spirit was poured out and there were uh, over 120 people there meeting when, when uh, the Lord poured out the Holy Spirit. Now, Paul closed his letter in his own handwriting. It was a common practice to, di to dictate letters and have a scribe to do the actual writing, but to add emphasis and a personal touch, Paul would sometimes uh, write a few closing remarks and sign his name uh, in his own handwriting. He ended this particular letter by using his own handwriting to pronounce uh, a curse upon those who were enemies to the Lord Jesus Christ. This curse was aimed at the people who had crept in among the saints 
and meant to do harm to the church. The word for curse is anathema, and it calls for the wrath of God to fall upon someone. Paul considered the enemies of Christ and his church as our own enemies. He, he had gone to great lengths to remove these saints who had uh, uh, been deceived by, the, by these false teachers. He, he went to great lengths to try to shield them, protect them, remove them from the influence uh, of these false leaders. Um, but he held out little hope that the false teachers uh, would change their way. So he pronounced an anathema on them, a curse. All he had to uh, had for them uh, was was that curse, that uh, uh, the anathema, because uh, they were so steeped uh, in their determination to to defy the gospel message of Jesus Christ and to mislead the saints. Now, Paul anxiously awaited the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. He followed that curse up by the word Maranatha, uh, which means our Lord come. And so Paul was looking for the return of Christ. The coming of the Lord means the resurrection of the dead, the transformation of the living, and the renewal of all things, and a new world of righteousness and peace. And so uh, Paul looked forward to that as we should look forward to that. This is what all Christians should look for and long for. Uh, um, as he did in the opening words of his letter, Paul conveyed his prayer and desire that the Corinthian saints would continue in the grace uh, and the undeserved favor of the Lord. He then reaffirmed his love for the saints, and with this, he closed his letter to the saints at Corinth. And that, that brings us to the close of 1 Corinthians chapter 16 and to the end of this great book. In our next session, we will begin studying the book of 2 Corinthians. Well, if you're ever in the Indianapolis area or you, or if you live in this area, I want to invite you to come visit us at New Direction Church, where my son, Kenneth Sullivan Jr., is the, is the lead pastor, the senior pastor. Our uh, east location is at 5330 East 38th Street, and our north location is at 7701 East 86th Street. Uh, for service time, just visit our website at ndcbetterlife.org. Please join me next time at this same time for another session of, of teaching through the Bible. Until then, may God richly bless you. Thank you for tuning in to Teaching Through the Bible with Dr. Ken Sullivan. We hope this program has benefited you in your Christian walk. For a free download of this program and to browse Dr. Sullivan's books, videos, and audio titles, visit our website at EmergeCurriculum.com. Please tune into our next teaching session on Vision Stream Network or listen on demand from our podcast.